to day three of the um, conference on geopolitics. And our theme is um, the domestic determinants of Southeast Asia uh, countries, foreign policy orientation um, towards the US and China. So uh, yesterday, day two, we discussed two very important topics. Uh, one is uh, the domestic determinants themselves, uh, the domestic factors that drive Southeast Asia foreign policy orientation. And then we have a second panel on um, bilateral security and economic relations between China and um, Southeast Asian countries. Now, let me quickly summarize some of the key themes from yesterday, and then uh, you know, it'll flow very nicely into today's um, panels, two more panels today. Now, um, so I think one of the key things that, um, key points that jumped out, uh, and to me, there are about three of them. Okay, so the first one is uh, regime survival, security, legitimation is a big uh, factor in driving uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, closer to China. Um, um, for countries like Vietnam and Laos, there's a lot of party-to-party pa party relations, and those are key drivers that also shape their relationship. In the case of Vietnam, providing stability even when uh, uh, there are issues over territorial disputes and historical uh, baggages. Um, now, uh, the second point that I think is, is key is that not all see China as a threat. I think that was pretty obvious. Um, in this part of the world, China is seen as an economic opportunity. And in some cases, uh, China is a security provider. Uh, that's an interesting difference that um, the region has, perhaps, with uh, the, develop the uh, western part of the world. Um, uh, now, not seeing China as a threat does not mean that there's no worries about Chinese dominance. I think there are concerns that China could be uh, uh, of Chinese dominance and over-reliance, over-dependence on China, primarily because that these could come at the expense of um, sovereignty of these countries. So, um, as a result of this wariness of Chinese dominance, there are preferences for diversification. Uh, therefore, you see countries, even like Laos, um, wanting to diversify, Vietnam wanting to diversify, uh, and also Thailand as well. Now, the third point that I think came across yesterday was the security does follow economics. So Chinese economic presence in the region is followed very closely by its security presence in the region. Uh, both in, the, in, the, in terms of sea lanes, South China Sea, uh, creation of ports, uh, bases uh, around, but also in the Mekong region as well, along, along the Mekong River, you can see um, um, Chinese increased uh, security presence, not so much as a result of uh, great power rivalry, but more in terms of uh, dealing with criminal elements uh, and um, uh, protection of uh, sailors, protection of uh, assets that are overseas. Now, um, today we turn to uh, the other set of relationship, which is the security uh, and uh, economic ties that the region has to the United States. And we have with us today, uh, we are very privileged to have uh, Mr. David Rang from Yale University with us, and our Professor Meli who is from RSIS uh, with us uh, today to be our discussants. So as usual, we're gonna start off with, uh, David will, will go first, and then uh, Melly, am I, am I okay? You're okay with that, okay, great. And then uh, after that, we'll have uh, Tiha uh, from uh, ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute respond, and Paul uh, from Chula Long Kong University uh, respond to uh, some of these comments. And then we'll open up to the floor uh, in the last 20 minutes or so of the meeting, uh, for both the paper authors, uh, the, uh, the rest of the paper authors to respond, and as well as questions from the audience. Okay, so um, everyone, welcome back again, and uh, let us start off today with uh, David giving his comments. Yeah. Great. Th thanks, and, and it's good to be here. I should start by apologizing and saying I, I am at the uh, difficult intersection of pride and bad handwriting. Uh, pride because I don't like to wear my glasses, uh, but 
ban bad handwriting makes it uh, necessary with my aging eyes. So uh, if, if at time to time I lose myself, uh, you, you know why. Uh, Millie and I, we decided to, to divide up, uh, divide and conquer, uh, just as the Chinese and Americans plan to do in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to take a look at the three uh, uh, mainland Southeast Asian papers that were yeah, in the group that we saw, and, and I'll leave to Meli the, the uh, maritime uh, nations. Uh, and I leapt at the opportunity to do that. And I've got to say, even though La there was a paper from the Laos representative, and I will talk a little bit about that one, I just loved the opportunity to uh, talk about the, the paper from Thailand. Uh, and Vietnam, because I just I think those two papers just make clear what a, uh, a, a diverse region Southeast Asia is. How hard it is to talk about Southeast Asia a, as a region at times. So um, you have one paper that the you know rep from Thailand, a uh, longtime U.S. treaty ally, uh, you know uh, fought on the side of the United States in in uh, 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 in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then a, uh, a paper uh, talking about conditions in a country which is a uh, one-party Marxist-Leninist state. And, you know, if I just told you that, and you're sitting in the United States, you would think, well, it's clear which one is going to be more pro-American uh, and which one is going to uh, uh, sort of uh, tend to hedge much more strongly towards China. And, of course, you'd be completely wrong that, that you know, as you read the papers and as you, you all know, that Vietnam uh, uh, has tended to uh, lean much more closely to the United States despite uh, the uh, uh, ideological differences and despite real concerns, as Haas' paper makes clear, that the uh, regime has about uh, certain elements of US policy. So I just think it's really, really interesting. Uh, and I should say that although I am of Yale University now, my background, I, am, I, I spent 30 years as an American diplomat, so I'm more of a bureaucrat uh, than an academic. And so I, as I talk about these papers, I will talk about them more from the from the perspective of a policymaker and how I consumed them and at, uh, the things I appreciated and the things where I, I wish that individual papers or the papers collectively uh, had, had uh, 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 sort of focused a little more attention. So here come the glasses. I, I would say, uh, one thing that struck me about the seven papers is just how differently the, the authors took the, the, the task, and, and they took the, the writing in, in a, a, a really wide range, a number of different directions. And for me, who is a novice to Southeast Asian politics and, and relations, it was really useful, although I, I, I found myself not frustrated, but at times wishing that there had been more of an external structure imposed on the writers that would allow me to sort of uh, uh, see them not just as individual assessments of where the United States and China fit into uh, 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 the region, but more structurally, uh, sort of a, a unified across the seven uh, uh, writers. So, so I, it would give me a little bit of better idea of uh, sense of of how to measure up uh, the the various uh, the, the the United States and China's efforts in those individual countries. Uh, for example, the, the paper from Laos was, was very much focused on high level, essentially strictly government to government relations uh, and, and, and didn't talk about elite politics or, or uh, politics among sort of ordinary uh, citizens. Uh, the, the Thai paper uh, focused, I think, more on uh, elite level politics and the Vietnamese paper, uh, Ha, your paper, uh, talked to a greater extent about the, the uh, popular opinion uh, and, and its influence on uh, 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 Vietnamese perceptions of the United States and of China. And I think all of those were really useful. I, I, it would have, I think, to my mind, been, been useful to have a sense of all of those levels in all of the papers. Uh, uh, going through uh, again as a novice and probably is you know to the extent someone uh, that Washington uh, readers or maybe Beijing readers would be looking at these uh, it would be useful um, and although I, I recognize now that the uh, topic of this session is economic and security relationships I sort of put those aside and uh, Selena as you were talking about you know uh, how Chinese uh, 
priorities, security tends to follow economic interests. I would say it's essentially the flip side in the United States that, that uh, secure, we have tended to be a security first uh, in our relationships with Southeast Asia. I think part of that is, uh, uh, well, I would say a significant chunk of, of that is just the fact that we have a trillion dollar uh, uh, defense budget in the United States. And when you have a trillion dollars, when you have that kind of a hammer to sort of quote Abraham Maslow, the, uh, you know, the, the problems in, in wherever we look tend to look like nails. And so uh, we just have the resources uh, uh, if, from a security perspective uh, to try to address uh, the needs that we see in Southeast Asia. And those of you who follow American politics know that that at least I, I think a much more, or at least a very useful uh, uh, additional set of tools would be economic and trade. But it's just our own domestic political situation just makes using those or putting them on the table just really, really difficult these days. And so I think uh, uh, my, my strong hope is that uh, economic and trade tools uh, will follow security arrangements that we have uh, with the various Southeast Asian states, but we seem to be uh, coming at it from a very uh, different per direction uh, than China. But what I focused on uh, uh, as I was reading this, and, and what really jumped out, Paul and Ha, from your papers, uh, is the discussions of human rights and American human rights policy uh, uh, in China. And uh, I, it got me wondering uh, the extent to which American human rights policy is a relic of the unipolar moment policies that both of you uh, pointed out were really put uh, real challenge, really strained the, the official relationships between the United States, regular human rights report, the trafficking in persons report. And I, I started wondering, you know, to the extent that's an issue, and it seems very clearly from your papers to be an issue, uh, it would have been useful to me to, to have an assessment Oh, okay, it puts strains, but is it working? You know, is there evidence that American human rights policy, the very public uh, and I would say probably uh, non-Asian way of getting at problems, is that having an effect? Is it, you know, are, is it producing results or is it simply creating friction uh, in our relationships? And the flip side, I think, is also worth asking. The Chinese, uh, you know, non-interference in, in internal affairs, uh, it clearly has advantages at the elite and at the government levels, but does it have disadvantages with populations? That, you know, are there advantages to a, a high profile uh, uh, American uh, approach uh, that, that uh, China suffers uh, because they have a very different approach? Uh, and, you know, if it's not working, uh, I, I think that would be a useful message for uh, American policymakers to hear that, that uh, hey, that approach isn't working. You know, these are uh, 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 thoughtful scholars, uh, not po polemic, but just saying that the approach isn't working. Maybe you should not change your approach on, on human rights. I know, Ha, in your paper, you talk about the success uh, of the Obama administration in having quiet conversations mm -hmm. Uh, at the highest levels, that there are other ways without, uh, without sacrificing our commitment to our values of communicating the messages that are important uh, in a way that, is, that, that makes then uh, the important work of, of developing relations uh, and advancing U.S. ties in Southeast Asia a little easier. And with that, Melly, maybe I'll turn it over to you to, to knock down the, the four island states. Thank you, David. <clears throat> um, I, I would like to start by really thanking the um, organizers of this conference. Um, in, in focusing, uh, putting a lot of attention on the domestic determinants of foreign policy, I say that because um, very often in the field of international security and relations, which were, um, I, I'm, I work on, um, domestic politics is, is messy. <laughs> And yet, when you look at the terms like paradoxes in the, in the foreign policy and in their relationship with major powers like China and, and the U.S., then a, a deeper dive into the dynamics of domestic politics helps to understand why there are conflicting messages. And they are not, in fact, paradoxes in the sense, but rather a... a um, 
a kind of um, a reflection of the dynamics of negotiation and accommodation of various interests uh, found in the domestic setting. So, um, so thank you for organizing this, this kind of, of uh, workshop. Um, and I also am very uh, delighted to read the different papers and that, you know, that gives you, particularly from younger <laughs> scholars, I think, gives you a fresh look at the, the you know, the, the readings of, of domestic politics, the, the drivers of domestic politics in, in explaining uh, relationship between ASEAN states, Southeast Asian states, sorry, I, I always try to mix that up, although I'm always told that Southeast Asia is not necessarily ASEAN. But, <clears throat> so, um, David talked about the, the maritime, uh, sorry, the mainland uh, Southeast Asia, and I thought, thought I'll talk about the maritime, but when you talk about some of the, the commonalities and differences, I am sometimes tempted to also uh, mention a bit Thailand. Um, so let me begin by, um, by f I guess, rehashing some of the points that, uh, or issues that came out yesterday if only to uh, enrich or to, to uh, generate more discussion on what I think are very salient points in thinking about, uh, in this particular panel, what are the economic and security priorities of Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the United States. So I will focus my, my discussion on that. And one of the things that came out clearly, and as mentioned by, by, uh, by, uh, by Selena, is this whole notion of, of, uh, of legitimacy or legitimation. And when you start from that, um, then it helps you understand why certain states feel uncomfortable with perhaps some of the policies that uh, the US administration have had over the years. But at the same time, when you look at the basis of legitimation, and this is where I really enjoyed reading the paper of Terence, when he talked about, okay, you can talk about hedging, but to what extent do these strategies actually meet the political goals? And political goals of political leaders is to ensure that they get the support, right? The, 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 uh, the kind of consent by the, by, by the constituency, the people, that it, in, it is in fact delivering on the promises of that legitimation, which is, you know, amongst others, providing for economic security, political security of, of, of different uh, groups and communities in, in individual states. So I think it is important to, to, underst to, to dig dive into, uh, into this whole notion of, of legitimation. And when you talk about legitimation and political legitimacy and how that shapes foreign policy, you have, therefore, to also understand, and this is what uh, the domestic politics scholars are saying, open up the block box of domestic politics in looking at the actors, the salient significant actors that shape foreign policy. So in the discussions of the Philippines and, uh, and Indonesia, you talk about the Philippines, Raymond's paper talk about the role of the executive, and in the constitution, it is the president that's of the authority to craft foreign policy. Well, yes and no, because there's also, of course, the, 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 the Senate committee. In the case of, of Indonesia, you do have uh, the executive, but you have the dynamics that's happening in Commission One of the Parliament where you know, you, it brings together different constituencies, different uh, uh, parliamentarians from different uh, you know, political orientations, if you like, and has strong, and uh, carries with them very strong ideas about the Indonesian culture, the Indonesian uh, religion, right? And, and how that actually shapes in their thinking about how Indonesia should actually relate to to, uh, to, to the United States. And there's, of course, the role of the military. This is, I think, very important in the case of Thailand. Um, <clears throat> well, the military has not, uh, f you know, for the longest time, has had this experience of coming in, coming out of, of Thai politics. But increasingly, um, you know, they have, they have come into power, most recently in 2014. I know, of, despite the election, announced election, in, in May, I think, of this year. Uh, to what extent do the military, for example, still 
with its long, uh, despite the, the discomfort and, and, and the unhappiness with, with the United States, for example, always harping on the unconstitutional way of, of getting power, uh, and at the same time, all the human rights violation, do the long history, historical uh, relationship with, with the US from, the, from their training, actually, how does it play into the thinking of uh, the foreign policy uh, with regard to the United States? So the preferences of these elites, I think, are very important and helps to understand this so-called, um, Quirk always talks about the three points of um, elite uh, legitimation. I, I, I need you to explain that to me further, but it, it helps to understand the different shades, perhaps, of, of that policy. I won't call it so much paradoxes, right, but how it actually th tries to nuance itself. Um, and the other thing that I th that's not often mentioned, and this is also found in, 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 uh, in the Philippines, which have a close uh, uh, political, uh, historical, and social ties with the U.S. is the role of the oligarchs, right? There was this discomfort, for example, during the Duterte administration that it was veering away from, from the U.S. and because Duterte was trying to, you know, he was an outsider who was trying to uh, disenfranchise, if you like, the old oligarchs, but they have come back and the old oligarchs uh, in the likes of the, the current president, for example, have had a long history and have benefited from the policies of, of the United States. So it would be interesting to note, as Terence said, the, the, the dynamics of elite politics and how they actually then inform the direction of the, uh, this relationship with the United States, right? <clears throat> Going back to the military, uh, it's again also, also in, uh, it has benefited a lot from closer defense and security relations with the US. When you look at, for example, the, the um, <clears throat> the attempts or the policies of, of Indonesia for defense uh, um, modernization and, and transformation, the enhanced bilateral training that the US and the Philippines had, uh, and, the, and of course, the people-to-people -people exchange when it comes to um, uh, all, all these um, training exercises, uh, sending uh, um, military personnel to the US and vice versa, and this has grown over the years with the expanded cooperation in counterterrorism, in maritime security, and cybersecurity. So, actors and institutions. But the other thing that to me is interesting when you look at how domestic politics and the dynamic shape also the direction of their policies uh, uh, with that of the United States is again the processes of legitimation. And when you look at, and, and I'm delighted that, uh, that uh, Quek and, and Terence and I would uh, also um, encourage uh, Adi to look at the, the work on Mutaya Alagapa's basis of legitimacy. Why is that important? Because when you, took at, when you look at the incentives for deepening ties, whether it's from the U, whether with the US or China, the, the economic basis, right, as part of the legitimacy is to be able to fulfill that social contract of providing economic security to your people. This is very important because <coughs> part of the ideology, security ideology of countries, particularly in the maritime Southeast Asia, is this whole notion of, you know, st stability through or resilience through comprehensive security. And what is comprehensive security? Other than uh, military uh, concerns, it also talks about economic concerns. In fact, the Indonesian notion of comprehensive security that has become the organizing concept of security in Southeast Asia uh, lays out very clearly the material uh, component of that, uh, of that legitimacy. And this is the theme that I, that I suppose runs through all of the papers. So it would be good to suggest the extent to which uh, this kind of um, legitimacy has actually sort of uh, played very largely in, in the calculation of the states vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with, with, with the United States. And yesterday, there was a lot of talk about, you know, this division of labor between the U.S. security, China, and economics. And sure, uh, given the, uh, the, the economic prowess now that's displayed by China, which offers immense opportunity for Southeast Asian states, the question is, is the United, the United States able to provide uh, that or to match that and the, 
the answer is not necessarily uh, clear or you won't necessarily say that the US is at the disadvantage because while the BRI offers a lot of uh, public goods, infrastructure development, etc., the US, even before the, the full, um, perhaps, concretization of IPEF, remains a major training partner and investor for countries in, in you know, the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, uh, what did I say, and, and Thailand, right? And the U.S. remains also the top three export markets of the state. So despite, you know, this, this whole um, discomfort with perhaps even uh, concerns about human rights, right, the U.S. is an important provider of that basis of legitimacy, which is economic security, right? And <clears throat> the other thing is le legitimation of core values, territorial integrity, non-interference, nationalism, identity. It would be good to push, for, particularly in the context of, of countries that have territorial disputes, the extent to which these values have actually really uh, influenced or, or deepened Southeast Asian's relations with, with, uh, uh, with, with the United States. Um, <clears throat> and in this case, um, I didn't find much discussion in, in the uh, papers on, on the whole um, push towards the rules-based international order, right? Um, sure, um, and this is very much, I guess, um, or very critical if, if we talk about protecting the core values of countries in, in, in Southeast Asia, because what is the rules-based international order is basically an iteration, right, of us, uh, of Southeast Asia's uh, principles and norms of non-interference, peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, and adherence to international law. And, and this is very important at, because it actually finds convergence with, I said, many of the values and the norms that Southeast Asia have promoted all this, uh, all this while. So um, the other thing is finally, I think my time is almost <laughs> up, this whole notion of um, um, the free and active foreign policy. I think that, that was mentioned, and, and the whole uh, the idea of neutral and non-aligned, and the extent to which uh, there are any different, perhaps, when you're talking about, because there's a lot of discussion about hedging, and I would, in, I would push uh, my, uh, the papers to talk uh, to to examine to what extent they are actually that they're not any different from the so-called free and active foreign policy. If hedging is in fact going to be active, right? It's not passive as compared to as what uh, Craig mentioned about passive equidistance is passive, right? So in Indonesia's free and active is actually also very active in the sense that you you know you don't you you are friends to all. And recently, in the case of the Philippines, although you talk about the three pillars of foreign policy, the statement by Aquino talks also about having being friends to all. So I, I think it is important also to see to what extent there's actually a hewing of these ideas. And I, I guess, oh, this is, should have been earlier. <laughs> The, the, uh, the views on uh, the US-led minilaterals like uh, Quad and, and AUKUS and to what extent this is actually goes against the so-called free and active foreign policy. Of course, there are statements from Indonesia. A, a Quack's paper talked about, you know, that the Malaysian foreign minister has actually talked about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggravating the so-called tensions in the region and could lead to arms race. But I was interested by the announcement of uh, by the statement of the Indonesian foreign minister in the last year's Shangri-La dialogue, where he could say, well, you can have your AUKUS <laughs> and, and, uh, and Quad, but, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, your friends are our enemies. Basically, if you read or if you perhaps un try to, to un um, un unpack what he's saying, he says, you can have that for as long as you don't touch us, and for as long as the so-called Asian way of, of managing conflict and, and advancing security approaches remains uh, untouched. So um, those kind of, of statements uh, perhaps 
highlights also this so-called strategic ambiguity that Indonesia has been promoting all this while. And uh, what is strategic ambiguity really? Is it the same as, for example, the whole notion of strategic autonomy? And you hear that not just amongst countries in, in the maritime states, but even uh, in, in Vietnam, for example, you hear this kind of phrases. So how do, how those, how do this, these initiatives and their ideas about strategies in, in promoting security, uh, you, know, you know, a good, uh, perhaps a deeper, uh, a wider uh, converse, uh, discussion on this uh, would perhaps be useful in understanding the thinking of countries with regard to the U.S. And finally, um, talking about Quad and talking about the basis of, of legitimacy, economic security, political stability, and, and uh, resilience, it is, it is useful to note that the way the Quad agenda has basically uh, expanded. It's not just about maritime security and perhaps to soften the concerns of, or to ease the concerns of countries in the region that it is actually uh, there to constrain China. Yes, there's tacit support for that. But it is also about providing for the other, uh, the, the other areas, the other issues of security. And what are that? You know, the issues of public health, for example, and the issues of climate change. And in fact, I'm glad to know that even in IPEF, one of the pillars actually talks about uh, clean energy and the de decarbonization. And uh, th this, these are incentives, or it hues very closely with the priorities that countries in Southeast Asia uh, uh, but, uh, you know, have outlined as uh, economic and security priorities, which in a way now has also been at least uh, articulated as part of U.S. policies in the region. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Leo. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Dave and, and Mali, because very good points here and really good uh, counterbalance to uh, the perceptions and the views that came out yesterday with respect to China. And uh, let me just quickly summarize what has been said and then uh, maybe uh, the lead authors can respond as you wish, and also uh, from the other authors and then the audience later on. Um, I thought that um, what was uh, really good about the discussion's comments is that um, first, that the process of legitimation, regime legitimacy is not, uh, you know, China is not just the source. U.S. is also a source. Uh, the United States is also a source of legitimation. Uh, in terms of security and economic ties, right? So that's that's really important uh, to note that we, in our narrative in this part of the world, that we forget that sometimes, uh, maybe because the US has been around for so long, China is this rising power, gets a lot more attention in the media, we forget that the US has been around for a very long time and did provide the basis of legitimacy for a lot of regimes in the region uh, in the post-Cold War era and uh, did uh, that still, uh, you know, in terms of security, in terms of economics, access to markets, um, and, and all sorts of things. And uh, with respect, that's one, one thing. The other one is uh, with respect to the liberal international order and the whole thing about values, human rights, and, uh, you know, the thing about the region is, um, when, it, when the, this part of the world, when we look at the liberal international order, we take certain things and then we discuss certain things. That's a, I think that's a good description. We do take certain values of the liberal international order, cap capitalism, international law, uh, you know, uh, sovereignty, um, things like that. But then we discard the human rights part of it, freedom of expression, free press, and that kind of stuff. So, with respect to LO, it's it's the it, but still, you know, it is uh, most countries in this region do adhere to the idea of the LIO. We do support it. We benefited from it. Although we pick and choose the ideas and the values that goes uh, into LIO. Um, the other thing that I thought um, that, uh, that came out was uh, the issue of public opinion. And um, I think maybe one of the things that the papers have, uh, the, the papers have not, with the exception of a couple, uh, that may need to flesh out a bit more is the role of public opinion. Now, one of the popular questions that we ask in academic circles is, does pop public opinion actually matter? Especially in countries where uh, the leanings are not, you know, not liberal democracies, but some form of, uh, of governance that is in between authority and government and democracy, full democracies. So, you know, on that spectrum, 
how does public opinion actually matter in shaping foreign policy choices in foreign policy orientation? And I suspect that for the seven papers, there'll be different answers for it. And I think uh, maybe the authors should also uh, look at that as well. So I think that there's a lot to chew on um, uh, from Dave's and uh, Melly's uh, very good remarks and uh, some things for the authors uh, to think about. Um, ha, do you want to um, res take the lead in responding first? Yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, I don't know where to start because <laughs> Um, yesterday, I learned a lot from the discussions and also from the inputs and feedbacks from uh, from from the discussions. Um, and I thought to myself that, oh, this is how an academic paper should be written, which I am not very much uh, familiar with. And I was trying to imagine in my mind how I should try to categorize um, certain uh, issues and topics that I have in my current paper into a more coherent analytical framework. And this morning, as I listened to Dr. Melly and Dave, and then I realized that, oh, actually, um, to, 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 to fulfill all of this uh, ambitious uh, scope, you know, uh, we may need a standalone book for individual ASEAN countries, not to mention, you know, like only in a paper and then you can cover all of this. Anyway, I, I, I do uh, appreciate very much uh, because Dr. Melly, uh, you do, uh, you did really uh, enlarge the aperture uh, a lot and for, for us to look at legitimation from, uh, from, from the comprehensive security perspective, which is actually applicable to all Southeast Asian countries. And you also um, broaden the, the horizon into how Southeast Asian countries perceive um, the rules-based, the so-called rules-based international order, the ILO. Um, uh, and, and, and Selena, you have rightly mentioned that Southeast Asia both uh, contributes to, but also diverges from the post-war, Cold War liberal international system. And um, Dr. Melly, you mentioned the Asian way. I think as far as Vietnam is concerned, we love the Asian values when we discuss uh, the, the, the human rights, right? But we don't like Asian way. I mean, uh, for, 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 for countries, small states like Vietnam, for example, international law must be the, the cardinal uh, more uh, legal compass for us, not the Asian way, because that could be conflated with uh, the, 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 the Chinese um, perspective about how differences, especially territorial and maritime disputes, uh, should be resolved in the Asian way. That means that you know we 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 settle it among ourselves as brothers. Uh, don't bring it to court, and that is something that ASEAN, Vietnam, except especially, would not agree to. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to address a point, a, a, a few um, specific points that um, Dave mentioned about the human rights. Um, I think it, it, it has something to do with the larger um, problem of Vietnam-US relationship, which is about the difference in the, the, the ideological differences. And in the first two decades after the Cold War and the normalization of Vietnam-US uh, bilateral ties, I think the paranoia in Vietnam, especially within the security apparatus uh, was still very, very deep and prevalent. But I think with time and with the strategic assurance, a political assurance at the highest level, and with the improvement of bilateral ties and the deepening economic uh, interdependence between Vietnam and, Ch and the US, I think that um, concerns or that anxiety about regime security has receded somewhat but it is still there. I think it will never go away. It is a structural drag on Vietnam-US uh, relations, and it needs careful uh, management, constant management, constant um, care uh, from both sides. Um, you asked about whether the US human rights approach uh, to Vietnam has been working. I, 
I'm not an, an expert on this, but from uh, whatever I know, I think some are working, some are not. Uh, especially if you talk about political rights, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, um, then it would be quite difficult. Uh, and and especially if you just address human rights, that is not uh, conflated with democracy, political pluralism, then I think there is still a certain level of acceptance from Vietnam. Uh, but the, 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 the more constructive avenues uh, would be in the social economic rights. And actually, the U.S. has 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 been doing that by promoting uh, capacity building and 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 improving the governance uh, in Vietnam and empowering like women, uh, youth, uh, um, the 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 ethnic minorities, the civil, uh, the disabled people. I think all of this social um, economic rise uh, would be uh, a more constructive avenue for for the US uh, to, to, to enter. Um, what else? Um, yeah, this yesterday, um, the Vietnamese uh, foreign affairs spokesperson just had a press conference in which she gave the comment on uh, the latest, the 2022 uh, US State Department uh, report on Vietnam human rights practices, which is a standard annual practice of the US State Department. And I know that it is a constant, an annual irritant to Vietnam to see that. Uh, but of course, I think we have, Vietnam has come to live with it actually. And the tone from the spokesperson has been quite constructive. Uh, she said that the, the, the report is not objective, uh, it doesn't really reflect the reality in Vietnam. Uh, but she said that Vietnam is open to have constructive and frank exchanges with the US. And this is a very forward looking tone. It is not a reactive defensive tone. And that shows that the US does have a lot of leverage with Vietnam in to the extent that you know human rights issues uh, is not really a, it's a structural threat, but it is not. Uh, Vietnam has been very careful not to let it affect the overall relationship. Um, partly, I think, or mainly because the US now is a very important economic partner for Vietnam. And this is something that I find um, I'm, that makes Vietnam very different from the rest of mainland Southeast Asia. Um, I think China has become the largest investor in all of mainland Southeast Asian countries uh, except, except Vietnam. And chi China is also the largest export market for all mainland Southeast Asian countries, uh, not, not, not to mention uh, as the largest trading partner. But for the US, um, Vietnam is very different because we enjoy a huge uh, trade surplus with the US that makes up for all the loss of trade deficit with China and with the rest of the world. And that is something that uh, the Vietnamese government really highly appreciates and would like to, 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 to maintain and advance. Um, so in that sense, I think the, the Vietnamese-US uh, relationship uh, enjoys a strong ballast uh, from the economic cooperation, and hopefully uh, that one will continue to hold. Yeah, maybe I will stop there first, and then maybe we can ad address other specific questions Great. later on. Thank you, Har um, Paul. Okay, th thank you very much for, for the comment. Um, perhaps I, I'll, I'll touch upon some thorough issues that uh, both of you uh, commented, especially on the le uh, regime legitimacy and legitimations, right? I think it's like a very important uh, and interesting point when you point out that 
you know, when you compare to uh, the Philippines, right, uh, the Thai-U.S. relations uh, is supposed to be, you know, like a pro-U.S. sort of camp. But why we are seeing this kind of like change of sea, you know, uh, especially in the post-Cold War conf uh, uh, era. So I, I think, of course, like the United States provide uh, legitimacy for regimes during the Cold War, and that you know, kind of like uh, consolidated the tie between the Thai elite and United States. But but uh, the, the problem in the post-Cold War is that you know the the U.S. work against the legitimacy most of the time of the Thai establishment, right? Um, actually, uh, even though I think. Like, I remember yesterday, uh, someone in the panel was uh, talking about the the gap because I was mentioning about the financial economic crisis in 1997, that sort of like uh, kind of like turning point in Thai-U.S. relations. But the gap between that, you know, you started to see actually the bending toward uh, China more and more. Uh, if you notice one of the incidents that uh, happened in 1992-93, uh, uh, the U.S. asked the Thai authority to get access to Utapau uh, Naval Airfield, right, in the Gulf of Thailand. But the Thai authority denied that, you know, and, and, and refused uh, uh, the, the automatic access to that, uh, to that uh, uh, military facility. So that's before financial crisis. And it, but this interesting point is that actually uh, we just concluded the agreement to give automatic access for the U.S. in 1992 during the Chuan Lee Pai government, which is like a demo uh, democratic government. But 1993, when U.S. wanted to use this for the Gulf, uh, the Gulf War, uh, the Thai authority you know, refused to to give the access. So you can st you start to feel that you know like the Thai elites start to to look at the Chinese as a, as a economic uh, uh, securities that would provide the Thai, whether or not it's uh, militaries or democratic regimes, uh, to to better perform, right? To show the public, the uh, the audiences, uh, you know, in domestic uh, politics that you know uh, when. Uh, they depend the tie with the Chinese, right? Like you can uh, boost the economy. I think I think that's a very important, uh, very important point. And then the financial crisis onward, uh, you can see like how the U.S. work against the regime security and legitimation. Uh, financial crisis, as everybody everybody knows, uh, the you know the Thai authority always complained that you know the U.S. gave very minimal support. You know, like when compared to the Chinese, that you know are trying to uh, stabilize the currencies and you know actively. Uh, uh, joy ASEAN to 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 you know uh, to correct all the the problems during the economic crisis. So the Chinese role has been like you know uh, playing up you know since the economic crisis, and even like during the elected government of the Thaksin administrations in the early 2000s, you can see that actually the U.S. also uh, worked against Thaksin legitimacy as well because he sort of has a hawkish approach toward the southern you know, unrest you know, uh, since 2001, and his uh, war on drug and mafia that you know, killed more than 3,000 people you know, uh, before the Philippines <laughs> did you know, like many years ago, uh, within three, three months. Right? So the U.S. criticized you know, that, that hawkish approach uh, uh, against this kind of uh, policy uh, of Thaksin, and that you know, like kind of uh, delegitimized his uh, political legitimacy at home. Um, also, uh, during the decades of a, the political crisis in Thailand since the first coup uh, in 2006, you know, uh, uh, in the 2000s period, until uh, 2014, and then the military came into power again in, and, you know, stay longer than normal in Thai politics. So uh, we kind of like, uh, uh, Thailand uh, faced a lot of criticism, pressure from the United States. That's, you know, like, uh, you can see like the, most of the post-Cold War period, uh, the benefit from the U.S. for re, uh, regime legitimacy uh, has been deteriorating. So uh, when that, that, that's come uh, to, 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 to be conflicting with the sort of like identities that, you know, perhaps like in, in my paper I didn't really touch upon, I was like talking to Melly before that. It's about identity when we talk about, you know, Thai-U.S. relations because we have like 100 years of official relations since, you know, like uh, the late 19th centuries. So um, we, we normally, like when we talk about Thai-U.S. relations, we talk about like 
uh, great friends. Normally, the elites will play up that kind of identity. So we are very close friends. We help each other during the Cold War. Uh, but then, like when you see this kind of uh, disillusionment, you know, in the post Cold War, uh, you know, the Thai elite would, would, would think that, well, why the best friends, you know, uh, always treat us like this, you know, uh, that that that's perhaps, you know, uh, similar to what Melly was saying that, you know, it's a comprehensive security that the Thai elite think about security alliance with the United States. It's not about security per se. Security after the Cold War, perhaps, you know, they don't share the visions that the Chinese uh, is the threat, you know, to Thai security. We don't have territorial conflict like Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia. So it's not a real threat to us. It perhaps, like, you know, uh, we're concerned about influence in economics, in politics, but not the threat per se. So in that sense, you know, when you talk about the Chinese, you know, like since the uh, Cambodia conflict. The Chinese became a, a security provider for the Thai, you know, after the U.S. U.S. retreated from from Vietnam War. So uh, it, you know, it kind of filled all the gap that the United States retreated from 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 Thailand, you know, since the Cambodia conflict, right? So uh, security uh, provider, economic provider, right? So help the regime to stabilize and uh, keep their performance, you know, uh, active. Uh, in the domestic politics. So that, in that sense, you know, it involves so much, you know, of the institution as well. It's like not only the military elite itself, but it's about like you know, the whole apparatus of the Thai state. Uh, if you look at the, of Thai politics, right, you can see not only the politicians, elite, but above that, you know, uh, it's monarchy, right? The monarchy also helps support this kind of uh, uh, Thai-Chinese relations, you know, uh, well, probably if you know Thai history, um, you know, the, uh, some of the royal family has also, you know, a Chinese uh, uh, you know, blood. So a lot of uh, practices in the court, you know, also shows how the Thai royal family you know, associated with the Chinese. So this kind of play up a lot, you know, uh, since the Cambodian conflict. Uh, we have the princess who study Chinese, uh, have the frequent, you know, uh, travels to China, you know, the, write about China, visiting China so many times, and, you know, bring up this kind of Chinese identity within this, uh, the end of the 90s when the Thai economies grew and, you know, see the benefit from China growing and opening up right after Deng Xiaoping reform. So uh, that kind of uh, relationship, you know, that's supported by the most revered institutions in the Thai societies, just, you know, make things different, you know, when we talk about like the U.S., right? Uh, in, even in, in Thailand, like, you know, uh, from that, uh, that period onward, we have this kind of phrase to show how how close we are with the Chinese. We use a family identity instead of like friend, you know, friendship, just like normal friend. We use Zhong Tai Yi Jin, you know, all the time. We are the same family. And for whatever reasons that perhaps for economic benefits that we want to associate with the Chinese and the growing economy since the end of the Cold War. So, and, and that, that, that's really helped, you know, embedded this kind of uh, uh, close ties and the popular feelings about the Chinese. They don't feel like, you know, the Chinese are very far, not the threat to us. So and th I think that that's the whole, you know, the Thai state apparatus kind of support that and business, right? We have a lot of uh, overseas Chinese uh, conglomerates who, uh, you know, like uh, play up with this like Chinese identity to, to invest in China, to uh, support that trade with the Chinese. And don't forget that, you know, we actually house, this, you know, house the largest one of, one of the largest Chinese populations, like overseas Chinese, you know, in terms of like the numbers, you know, perhaps like similar to the Indonesian uh, overseas Chinese. So basically that's, associated, you know, that kind of affiliations, you know, kind of uh, get stimulated quite uh, very easily in the Thai societies and that shaped the public opinion, you know, uh, uh, in favor of the Chinese. So somehow like, you know, when that's also like, you know, uh, uh, also associated with the, the, the issues of rule based international order. I agree with like many, many authors and, and commentators about like, uh, we are very selective, right? As long as it's, it, it support regime uh, legitimacy, we, we do that, you know. Uh, that's why like human right, democracies, uh, whenever, you know, the US trying to play up with this kind of issues, it's trying to, you know, like we kind of uh, feel uh, intimidated and, 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 and trying to, get to be against these kind of rules. So, um, 
in fact, actually, uh, it's very selective, and it 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 also uh, most of the 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 rule based international order would touch upon like you know what we actually support is self determination, non -de uh, interference open trade and investment, but not uh, human rights and democracy. And for the issues of the US-led multilateral initiative, I think as long as it remains in the realm of the economic openness, you know, non-traditional security issues, uh, at least you know, the Thai elite would, 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 would tend to support this kind of initiatives. You know, uh, by the United States, uh, but you know, if you look at the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, strategy now or the Quad or the development of increasing security focus of the United States foreign policies, uh, uh, you would see the Thai elite uh, reluctant, you know, to 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 support or at least you know, tacitly support, but not very pronounced in the public, because one of the things is that you know, uh, since the coup in 2014, um, they are quite quite concerned with the Chinese you know, pressures and view uh, of Thailand being closer to the United States and joining containment of China. So that would come with the, you know, more Chinese pressures on Thailand and the thing that, that could affect you know, economic benefit that we will we'll, we'll get from, from the Chinese. And the last point is that, you know, it's an interesting point that you know, Melly was mentioning about like actually the US provide economic security actually a lot you know, in, in Thailand case as well. Uh, US is the biggest market actually, not the Chinese. Right? And we, we, like what Ha was saying that you know, we actually uh, experience surplus in trade uh, in contrast to the, the Chinese, you know, uh, bilateral trade, we always have a uh, deficit. And that, the interesting thing is that, you know, the elite doesn't really use that uh, figure to tell the public. They always tell that, you know, the Chinese is important. Our bilateral trade, of course, in total with the Chinese is much more, but we you know, experience the, the loss, right? They don't use that kind of information to tell the public. You know, that's why like, it kind of shaped the public to see that you know, how the, chi the Chinese is very important to Thailand, right? Uh, recently, I'll, I'll, I'll close these remarks. Recently, when we opened you know, our border for, tour for, for tourists and the Chinese you know, abandoned the zero COVID, you know, it's very interesting that before that, you know, foreigners start to come to Thailand no welcome you know from the dignitaries you know from the ministry but when the chinese the first chinese group came three minister went to the gate and received the chinese tourists you know that's very i think it's important like how the elites actually see the chinese right see china as you know uh, as important uh, factors in, in, in Thailand. And, and that's why like, I still think that within this kind of uh, polarization of politics that I was uh, writing in my, my paper, and the elites still want to maintain the power uh, until a certain period. Uh, we don't know like, after elections that would be changed. But you know, as long as they are still in power, uh, this kind of uh, tilting toward uh, China will still continue. Thank you. Uh, very good, very good remarks and uh, responses. And I think that uh, the, the other thing that we might want to think about for the paper authors is the issue of identity. And I think that was a uh, little mentioned yesterday and it was mentioned again today. Uh, for those uh, seven countries where you actually have a large Chinese majority or minority, uh, meaning Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, to some extent Vietnam, uh, you might want to think about how uh, identity issues, uh, identity, uh, whether it's cultural or race or uh, business ties with China, plays into all of these. Uh, even for a country uh, that like Thailand and the Philippines, which are U.S. allies, I think that's uh, that's a big one. I think Ching Chi will tell you that uh, the race issue is a big one uh, in Malaysia and. Terence, too, uh, probably will elaborate on that one, too. Um, okay, thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. And um, now uh, we have about half an hour left for uh, responses from the other authors and also from um, uh, the audience. So uh, let me start with the paper authors. Uh, I'll give priority to them, uh, one or two of them, or three of them, if you have uh, things that you want to say. R Raymond took off your mask. Is it that you wanted to respond? Uh huh? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I 
I pick on people. Yeah, <laughs> women. Thank you. I didn't realize that you have a very uh, sharp eyes, uh, tiger eyes, so to speak. But thank you for giving me the the, the floor, uh, uh, the opportunity to also, if and with your indulgence, I would also uh, take this opportunity to uh, tease up some of the comments that came out yesterday. And and let me start with with uh, the comment about ASEAN uh, not having a position. Uh, and I would just like to flag that this is very interesting because when people say that ASEAN does not have a position, they don't realize that ASEAN does have a position. E except that uh, 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 ASEAN does not reflect the position that they want. And so when, when ASEAN does not reflect the position that these various actors want ASEAN to reflect, they suddenly criticize ASEAN of ASEAN not having a position. So uh, you have to be, we have to be, be careful about that. Similarly, uh, people talk about all the time about ASEAN not having one voice. And they mistakenly equate ASEAN not having one voice with having the same position. ASEAN does have a voice, and they have a common voice in so many issues, but, but it's not a similar position all the time. So you also have to distill those differences that are coming up from the uh, 10 ASEAN member states. Because don't forget that ASEAN is composed of, of 10, uh, 10 ASEAN uh, member states. So I, I, I thought I would uh, simply want to flag that. Uh, Oh, the other one is the, the, the point of uh, uh, the lack of rationality or optimality. But we always uh, tend to think of uh, optimality from an academic point of view. Let's not forget that uh, the context is a political context. And what may be rational and optimal from an academic, uh, ac academic point of view may not necessarily be optimal from a political point of view. So you have to place yourselves in the shoes of these political leaders. And this would make us understand why they arrive at certain positions, which to our perspective may not be optimal all the time. Now, let me now go to this view of the role of institutions, which Meli brought about. And I think it helps a lot in trying to understand some of the uh, 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 foreign policy orientations of our countries, particularly if, such as, for example, in the case of the Philippines. And I would allude to the fact that notwithstanding previously the seemingly anti-US uh, uh, pronouncements coming from the previous president. Uh, uh, why is it that uh, notwithstanding the fact that there were pronouncements that the visiting forces agreement will be, uh, what do you call this, scrap, uh, the, the EDCA would be uh, put aside. Uh, all these frameworks that we have as far as US-Philippine relations are concerned remain in place. It's precisely because of the role of the, both the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of National Defense, for that matter. So they kept the ties at these particular levels, so much so that all these things managed to basically uh, continue to exist. And, and, and so while well, you have a pronouncement, and this is very interesting in the case of the Philippines, because while well, you have a policy pronouncement coming from the executive, which according to our constitution is actually the primary mover of foreign policy, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs merely advises, at the lower level, at the level of the bureaucracy, you have very close ties still with the United States. And I think that kept the balance, uh, so to speak. Uh, the role of public opinion was brought up a while ago, uh, in, particularly in the Philippines, as I pointed out in my paper. If you are running for office, you better make sure that your, your, you address the public sentiment. And this explains why in the campaign in the 2016 election, the candidate then at that time who eventually won the presidency said, I will ride a jet ski, go to Scarborough Shoal or the South China Sea and plant our flag. And he was criticized for not having done so for his entire term. Okay, why? Because that is all about public opinion. You have to have something that would resonate to the hearts and minds of the Filipinos. And for the Filipinos, the, the, the matter of the South China Sea is something very, very close. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, you have to consider that, especially in the context of the Philippines, which is a electoral democratic society, supposedly. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Rickman. Uh, before I forget, to the paper authors, I mean, Ha expressed a few times anxiety that we're keeping the word limit. But I think Chin Hao and I, Chin, we can increase the word limit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, not to worry. I, I think we gave you a very short word limit. We can definitely increase it. We'll talk. Yeah. Uh, other responses from the other paper authors? Uh, Adi? Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Prof. Meli. I completely agree with you regarding the legitimacy. Uh, I have uh, some quick uh, response. Uh, first, uh, about the interaction between actor and institutions. Uh, sometimes institutions works as a channel for political actors and this interaction be between actor and institutions could be like you know a battle of legitimacy actually between political actors that's one and probably second uh, the second condition will be like uh, this interaction between actor and institu institutions become um, some kind like an arena for political actors actually to search for legitimacy and my uh, second response will be on identity. Uh, I think the one that uh, uh, Serena mentioned, uh, about particularly with the relation with China. And yeah, probably uh, for some of the uh, some of the states, Southeast Asian states, there will be some kind of like people to people relations. But we should also not forget that the sometimes uh, in some instances the main driver. Uh, is actually the government, so government to government relations. So this can be like uh, uh, become a, uh, another uh, point of view regarding the relation with China. And third, also about public opinion. Yes, I'm completely agree. Sometimes it becomes like a, of course, it will be like a push force. Uh, but then the question will be like, in what ways it actually affect the policy, and in what ways actually the le leaders would like uh, respond through foreign policy. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cheng Chui? Thanks very much. I think on the basis of uh, what Adi and also uh, Raymond have uh, 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 shared with us, let me share a few quick points to respond to uh, uh, Melly's invitation, encouragement for me to elaborate about the three uh, pathways of legitimation, the three P. Uh, and um, so the three P's, I think it's uh, related to actually what uh, Terry was uh, highlighting. Uh, fundamentally, all ruling elites uh, do one thing, to uh, stay in power. And uh, it's a matter of uh, how long to stay in power. And I will add that uh, it's also about how to stay in power. And how to stay in power is a matter of uh, using not just coercive authority, uh, but also moral authority. And this is where legitimation comes from. And uh, as mentioned, usually in the literature is that uh, the political legitimacy ma means a democratic uh, mandate. That is only one part, procedural, the first P, right? Procedural legitimacy. But uh, the cases of Asia and many other places uh, indicates that other than procedural legitimation, there are also about the performance. And performance is about economic performance. It can also be a performance uh, ability to tackle some nationwide issue. Why a Duterte uh, come to power and then uh, say that it's about drug, drug, drug issue, right? That's a matter of uh, performance as well. And other than procedural and also performance, there are a matter of uh, also the particularistic. Particularistic meaning that something that specific, particular, either uh, in the form of uh, leaders, charismatic, so Karno, uh, for example, enjoys some legitimacy. And there are also something that about uh, what Selena mentioned, identity, right? Something that specific, particular about a specific country. In Malaysia, no ruling elites uh, will enjoy legitimacy if they cannot manage the ethnic balance across uh, ethnicity. So you need to strike a balance. In the end, that, uh, those kind of uh, three pathways of legitimation does have impact on foreign policy. Just take uh, the case of uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand, since we have uh, two speakers, uh, two paper writers there. I think in the case of uh, uh, Vietnam, Right? I think I would say that uh, procedural legitimacy uh, would uh, compel ruling Vietnamese communist uh, elites to strike a balance to hedge because of, uh, from in terms of procedural legitimacy, as uh, Ha mentioned that the uh, US is actually a source of political problems. Whenever, every year when US uh, issue the human rights report, that pose a political uh, risk to the ruling elites. So procedural legitimation would mean that 
the, pe the party to party relations with Chinese Communist Party serve the political purposes of ruling elites. Although China is a security problem, and that relates to performance legitimation, performance legitimation require Vietnam to count on the United States to push back uh, China. But, uh, and then uh, eventually, particularistic is that eventually it's about autonomy. So Vietnamese uh, elites will need to strike a balance uh, to focus on autonomy so that you will not completely put any egg, all your eggs in any uh, big power because of, uh, that would harm your particularistic of uh, autonomy. Same uh, for uh, Thailand, which is, I think, more straightforward. Under the current uh, military uh, uh, regime, I think China become a source of uh, indispensable solution and support for all three pathways, procedural, performance, and particularistic. But particularistic uh, does constrain uh, Thai elites a little bit, and, uh, and therefore Thai elite will have to uh, sometimes selectively defy uh, China through the negotiation of the uh, Bangkok Nong Kai high-speed rail negotiation. When China requests something, Thailand will defer a little bit, constructing a 3.5 kilometer, but the rest, Thai will take their own sweet time as a way to defy uh, China in order to assert some Thai identity that Thailand will do things in Thai way, not Chinese way, despite the talk about the Zhong Thai, Yi Jia Qing. I will stop here. Okay, uh, any other paper authors would like to respond? Before I open up the questions, uh, the, f uh, the session to the f floor. Um, okay, uh, Sulata, come. Yeah. I like to ask a very specific question for Huang and uh, Paul uh, about uh, security, bilateral security relation. How does Vietnam will? Uh, a uh, corporate military exercise in, in Thailand. And for Po, uh, uh, the reason uh, military exercise between Thailand and China, what, what does it mean for uh, uh, Thai U the United States corporate uh, military exercise? What was it? How Thai people see the, the one with the, the Chinese one. What's, it, what, what is, what's the difference between the, these two? Thank you. Either one of you want to start first? Paul? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I think Kobago, um, from Thai perspective, I think, well, I, I, I'm not sure about the public opinion about this uh, military exercise, but it's quite you know uh, famous as at least you know the media cover this kind of exercise every years. And actually, it has been going on uninterrupted, you know, since uh, 1982, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that, that 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 that's the thing, right? I mean, like, I think somehow my opinion uh, about Kaba Go. Why the Thai uh, very fussy about this? Like, uh, especially uh, in the post uh, military coup in 2014, right? Like, there was this concern among the military elite that, you know, the US is gonna suspend this Cobra Go, you know, like uh, after, you know, all the suspensions of high level contact and military contacts uh, with the Thai government. But then the US didn't, right? But then I think the Thai elite see the Cobra Go as a prestige. So that's probably the legacy since the, the Cold War. The prestige of the Thai uh, security allies United States within the hierarchy right, of the uh, security orders in, in the regions. You know, like not many countries that have like, you know, security alliance, formal security alliance with the United States, you know, but Northeast Asian one and the Philippines and Thailand. But the, the, the problem of the Thai security alliance is, is underperformed. Right, because like the lack of the uh, common threat since the the, the post Cold War, so uh, somehow th these cover goal it's like acting as like you know to reaffirm the Thai elites that we are still important, you know, even though we are not, right? We doesn't really uh, have any utilities besides like non traditional security in Mekong, which is not in the U.S. priorities, you know, since the post-Cold War, because the U.S. has like, you know, uh, 
war in in the Middle East and then conflict with China, you know, like uh, and more maritime, you know, focus rather than the continental focus. So the Thai Security Alliance is not like you know very, uh, it's not like very performing, you know, in in such way. Uh, they're trying to sort of like you know in the title of like reinvigorate the Security Alliance so many times. There were like you know conferences, you know, throughout you know the, the, the two decades, but. <laughs> There's still no, nothing, right? I mean, like it, it keeps repeating this way, and I have noticed that uh, there's nothing substantial out of this. So basically, uh, the Thai uh, military elite thinks it's a couple goal, just like you know, give them the opportunity to to show the international audiences and their own domestic audiences that you know we are still close to the United States. But the thing is, like, we don't really take any uh, ben much benefit from 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 the Cuba goal. Uh, so in in that sense, you know, uh, it just acts as the pre prestige, you know, augmentations of the Thai Thai elite. When uh, the exercise with the with the Chinese actually started uh, actually earlier before uh, the coup in 2014. Actually, the the uh, joint drills between the, uh, the Thai armies and the Chinese army uh, started in early 2010, if I don't remember wrong. Uh, and then it's kind of developed, you know, gradually. And then, it's, well, it get, just like gets simulated after the, the, the coup in 2014, right? It, and it cover all, now it cover all the, the, the armed forces, right? The, the armies, the air force, and the navy. So it, it started to grow, but you know, a lot of people still think that you know, actually, it's not as important as the Cuba goal, the U.S.-Thai alliance, because it's still in smaller scales. But you know, you know, in the long terms, I mentioned in my paper that uh, some security analysts, kind of observer, uh, uh, were concerned that you know, in the long run, if this happened, you know, uh, continuously, uh, our military uh, uh, orientation could you know change to adapt to the Chinese, you know, um, weapons, techniques, and everything. And, you know, and, and actually, if you think that how relaxing the Thai military uh, elite, uh, it's about, you know, the Chinese. Uh, in Kabako, actually, uh, the Thai uh, militaries actually asked the, the U U.S. counterpart to open uh, Kabako for, for the Chinese to participate in certain degree. Not everything, not the interoperational abilities, you know, all those uh, command and control, but at least, you know, to observe, to participate in a lot of activities in, in Cobra Go exercise, especially humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. But, you know, the Chinese, like, trying to push, you know, more and more that, you know, we should, uh, you know, yeah. uh, enjoy more things. Can I just ask a quick question before Ha replies? Yeah. How much is uh, prestige associated with the Security Alliance mm. uh, with the US a source of legitimation for the Thai elites? Um, I think in the post Cold well, in the Cold War, of course, right, it's, it's this kind of like a prestige that we have the bilateral security alliance. And in the post Cold War, it acts as like, you know, um, you know, to, 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 to show the public that the military is still important in Thai politics in that sense. Like whenever uh, the U.S. kind of threatened to suspend the Cobra Go, uh, the Thai elite would just like, it's, they are very, uh, you know, they run around. You know, you can see that they're concerned, a media go to ask them like what they think about this. And they think like, oh, whatever, you know, but actually like when we talk to, to them in person, they feel like, oh, uh, they're not gonna do any exercise with us, so we're gonna lose face, you know, in the public, you know, that kind of thing. I think it, it acts that way. This is uh, external validity uh, that you uh, that regimes require uh, to stay in power. I think uh, that's interesting and should probably come out in the paper as well and talk about the U.S. part of it. Uh huh. Um, Cobra Gold, I have never heard of any Vietnamese response to Cobra Gold. Um, I think there was report uh, last, a few years ago that Vietnam would join uh, or like participate as an observer, but I don't know, I, I don't see it uh, reported anywhere in Vietnamese uh, mainstream media. Uh, but the Vietnamese media also covers the annual uh, Cobra Gold exercise and there is no sense of anxiety or worry. Uh, it is just, you know, they carry a lot of photos of, you know, uh, American and other soldiers drinking the blood of the, the Cobra Gold and uh, it is very, um, it's just a factual 
uh, reporting. Uh, but it is also interesting to note that um, this multinational exercise takes place in mainland Southeast Asia, but countries that are directly participating in this uh, exercise are from maritime Southeast Asia. So uh, only Thailand is the mainland country. I think if you asked this question like two decades ago, or right after the Cold War, because this, this is a long-standing exercise. Uh, it could be a cause of concern for Vietnam, maybe. But I think nowadays, Vietnam would be more interested in maritime exercises uh, uh, in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. And we, I think, tacitly support it. Uh, but maritime, oh no, no maritime, exercises in mainland Southeast Asia and COBRA, which is a long-standing one and its ambit has been extended to um, dealing with uh, a a response to non-traditional security issues, then I don't think it registers too much as, as a threat or even a concern. Uh, questions and responses? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll take two questions at the same time. Please say uh, who you are, your affiliation, and keep your comments and questions short. Thank you. Hi. My name is Lester Lee. I'm a parent of a, a YNC alum. Um, questions uh, about, um, I think, uh, the emerging theme on uh, U.S.-China uh, relations, which is uh, decoupling and friendshoring. We hear that quite a bit. Is there is it a factor in the bilateral relationships with either China or the U.S. when it comes to either taking advantage of this idea of a decoupling or friendshoring, or is it something that's problematic for the ASEAN countries to deal with? This other gentleman. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brandon. I work in public health care in one of the government hospitals in Singapore. I actually read, uh, my question is for Huang. You wrote, a, you wrote an article called A Tale of Two Vaccine in Vietnam about um, the vaccine from um, the United States and also in China. I have it here. I wanted to ask for your opinion uh, on you know, the, the COVID for the, the last two years and, and has the procurement of vaccine from the two big powers, China and and, and and U.S., uh, what, are, what, is, what is your opinion so far? Because you wrote this in 2021, and now we are coming out of uh, the, the, the pandemic, right? So I'd like to get your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, no, so maybe the, uh, anybody uh, wants to respond to the tec uh, decoupling technology, decoupling economic decoupling? Yeah. Uh, for Vietnam, uh, well, first of all, I think decoupling needs to... Uh, it needs to be unpacked and verified and examined at the sector level um, in individual uh, countries as well. Uh, I think as far as Vietnam is concerned, I could safely say that Vietnam has been on the ban on has been receiving quite a lot of benefits from these trade tensions between the US and China. Um, Prior to 2018, uh, before the tariffs, uh, the U.S. tariffs on Chinese exports uh, were in effect, Vietnam-U.S. trade uh, volume was increasing, was increasing uh, gradually, but not sharply. But starting from 2018, then it was it just shot up like this, and uh, Vietnam does export a lot. Of, uh, of of products to 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 the U.S. and um, and and I would not frame it as like Vietnam as a, a pure beneficiary because a lot of Chinese manufacturers have relocated to Vietnam as well to take advantage uh, of of these uh, you know lower tariffs and this is a cause of concern for the U.S and also for Vietnam, and then the U.S. has sent a warning to the Vietnamese government that, you know, don't let your country become a point of transshipment only. Uh, but anyway, I think Vietnam does benefit hugely. Uh, the, 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 the trade surplus, as I mentioned, was uh, impressive, was amazing, actually, because suddenly Vietnam became one of the top 10 trading partners of the U.S., 
in the first 10 months of 2022, it even replaced the United Kingdom as the seventh largest trading partner of the US. Um, in terms of investment, I think there was a lot of, there is a lot of excitement as well. Um, and about, you know, receiving the, the next wave of relocation of manufacturing from China because of reshoring, French shoring, uh, French shoring, not reshoring. Um, but part of that reshoring is also, uh, French shore, part of that relocation is also undertaken by Chinese um, export, uh, Chinese manufacturing uh, companies as well. And that's why we cannot just like neatly uh, say that this is a loss for China and it's a pure gain for Vietnam. But I think the expectation now from Vietnam is that more high value uh, manufacturing relocation will move from China to Vietnam so that we can up the value chain uh, instead of you know just staying as a, a cheap uh, manufacturing uh, hub uh, as China used to be. Would you like to say something before I address the vaccine question? Yeah, probably about decoupling. Uh, I think uh, similar to Vietnam, Thailand also benefits from relocations of uh, some investment from China, but probably not as much as Vietnam. And actually, uh, the Thai uh, the government, you know, uh, see this as the 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 uh, the benefit to its own economic uh, planning, right? Especially uh, recently, they come up with these uh, uh, Eastern Economic Corridor, you know, kind of revitalizing the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, in the east, uh, eastern coast of Thailand, to to you know, kind of transform the Thai economies to uh, the next generations, you know, green economy, um, uh, high tech industries, and then uh, during that time, there's a lot of uh, uh, Chinese investment in this area. You know, compared to the United States, you know, um, I think uh, on even though the, the 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 stock FDI of the United States is still higher than the, the than, than the Chinese, but annually it you know uh, kind of surpass the uh, United States and even the Japanese, which is like a traditional uh, FDI you know uh, investor in Thailand. So uh, in that sense, you know, the, the the since the military coup, I think uh, the Thai elites you know look at the the Chinese Chinese as like even more, uh, you know, economic opportunities for, for for the Thai government to 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 perform well in this kind of like project, right? Because uh, it, it kind of like want to tap on the, uh, for example, like high technologies from 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 Chinese uh, industries and logistic support, right? Like logistic investment in Thailand just to promote Thailand as a, one of the regional logistic hubs, you know, in in especially in mainland Southeast Asia. You, you can see like a lot of e-commerce from uh, companies like from China, uh, also moved to set up their own, you know, uh, silos and everything in, in Thailand so that they can just like distribute the products, you know, uh, very fast in, in mainland Southeast Asia. And our platform for e-commerce is normally dominated by the Chinese uh, companies, right? So uh, the e-commerce, the 5G networks also, we also relies on, on the Chinese technologies. Now, many years ago, before I moved back to Thailand, I was like told by some of the observers that actually the Huawei, uh, you know, uh, company uh, put the test bed actually in my, on my campus now. You know, like before that, under the the research collaborations, before it rolled out to be commercialized, you know, in the a couple of years later. So in that sense, you know, like uh, we rely on uh, the Chinese technology a lot, and I think this kind of uh, economic uh, development planning uh, sort of like benefit the Chinese to 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 move into Thailand. Okay, so uh, how you want to talk about the vaccines? And I think after that, um, Melly has a two finger on. Okay. Um, the vaccine story is very interesting, uh, but I think it has something to do with um, the general uh, distrust among the Vietnamese of the Chinese products. I, and I don't want to generalize it because there are many good Chinese products. I think the most, uh, the most commonly used uh, smartphones in Vietnam are from Chinese brands because they are good, great, and cheap, affordable. Uh, many people like us, we use, if possible, we use iPhones, Samsung, but many, many uh, average Vietnamese people, they use Huawei, or Huawei is expensive. Oppo, for example, 
Um, so uh, that being said, I think the Vietnamese distrust in the U.S. Uh, no in the Chinese uh, products has something to do with the nature of their trade as well because a lot of trade between Vietnam and, the, and China is done through cross-border and that means that you know it, it, we normally receive a lot of substandard products and, and, and there is that kind of embedded uh, distrust in Chinese products and when it comes to a health product and, uh, and something like vaccines uh, I could tell you that the Vietnamese people really, really uh, appreciate the American, not the Western products. Um, it is quite different from Singapore, actually. I think I, I noticed that many Singaporean people, they have trust in Chinese, um, Chinese uh, vaccines, but not in Vietnam. And then I follow the story and all that. And since then, um, the, the, the perceptions have not changed at all. Um, uh, but I, I would like to, to, to broaden this, this topic a little bit because the Vietnamese government actually, in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, they follow exactly the same formula of the Chinese uh, uh, government, total lockdown, for example, until that policy couldn't hold anymore. But it is interesting that the Vietnamese government, right from the beginning, unlike the the the, Philipp, no, the, the, the Indonesian government, they were not actively seeking to secure the source of vaccine supply from China at all. Uh, partly because there was this com, 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 uh, complacency that you know, we were successfully containing the pandemic, but uh, but 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 at the same time, I think. W only until mid-2021, when the Delta variant swept across the country and we couldn't get enough vaccines, then of course any donations, be it from China or from anywhere in the world, would be appreciated. Yeah, I, I just wanted to weigh in on this because you're in public health. If you're talking about possible areas where you can really, s you, you can sort of see some kind of geopolitical competition. You can actually see it in the area of public health. And that's something that's very important because, um, as you know, the, the, the concern about you know, the next pandemic is always being now um, announced by the, WH the WHO. And <clears throat> when you're talking about assistance to public health measures, right, whether it is in upping up your cap capacity to uh, to deal with health emergencies. Um, this is where you can see that US leadership right, is, is very important. And when you talk about the, the opinion of, of countries in the region, they're actually looking at the lack of leadership that the US had. And this is where the shift of the agenda of Quad to provide for public health assistance, not just on vaccines, Right, but also in ensuring that you actually up the level of competence and capability of public is, is very important. The U.S. support for ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies, right, which is I think uh, now being uh, it's a virtual one in Thailand, and the support for Vietnam's CDC in in uh, uh, sorry the the CDC in Vietnam is very critical. And this is where you you would like to see where China is going to position itself, because in this case, as mentioned by her, the, it's that psyche among, I think, Southeast Asians that the U.S. has the advantage, the technological advantage. And because of transparency, right, it's easier, I think, for people to trust so-called U.S. products. But this is an area for another geopolitical competition. <laughs> uh, so we have one question from Ryan uh, and uh, Mapo, Ma right? Uh, so maybe I'll take the two questions, Ryan. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, these great presentations and discussions. Uh, as I've been reflecting upon the conversations over the past couple of days, it's really struck me that it seems like many countries in the region are trying to navigate between these two challenges. On one hand, fear of abandonment uh, by the United States, and this is amplified by Trump, by withdrawal from TPP, by Afghanistan, and, and other issues. But on the other hand, uh, a concern about China becoming a, a increasingly aggressive actor in pursuit of its st strategic goals. 
but as I have listened to the conversation, it feels like the concern appears weighted more towards the abandonment side of that spectrum than the uh, Chinese as an aggressive actor in pursuit of its strategic objectives. So I, I had two questions that I just wanted to pose, and if this bleeds into the next panel, that's fine as well. But the first is, am I hearing this correctly? Uh, I, am I leaving with the right impression of, of views from the region? And secondly, it's pretty widely accepted in the United States that, that Xi Jinping, under his leadership, China's activities and behavior are discontinuous with its recent past, with the Deng era sort of period of reform and opening and Taoguang Yanghui and that China's foreign policy has become much more animated by a grieving um, uh, sort of past humiliations and trying to address territorial disputes more forcefully. Why is that view not more widely shared in the region? Thank you. Uh, okay, last question from Mapo, and then uh, responses, and then we'll close. from China's Nanjing University. Uh, I have uh, actually a comment uh, followed by Professor Guo Qingshui's uh, 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 comment to you because I think it's a very important thing that when the Chinese come here, we should use the Chinese way of doing things or the ASEAN way. I think uh, <laughs> uh, my, my personal uh, observation is that I think uh, back to a few years ago, the ASEAN way may not receive positively back to China because it means very th things are very slow in motion. But I think uh, for the past few years, particularly after BRI has been launched in this region, uh, this perception has been changed both from the elites of China and from the mass. The Chinese mass now come to ASEAN countries because they want to slow down their, their lives, right? <laughs> and for the elites, I think uh, we, we also try to adopt the ASEAN way of doing things. One Chinese ambassador post in this region personally tell me that he has to learn to play golf uh, in order to meet his counterpart in the country. So I think um, when one of the, our top leaders say uh, we have to have the deal of the COC by 2023 or 2024, our expert personally feel it's very hard. So I think I, I just want to emphasize, once uh, we come to this region, we, we now feel the ASEAN way is, should be fully acknowledged and fully respect, uh, different from the Chinese way when we're back home, where Jack Ma probably said that <laughs> Uh, working 996 means nine to nine per day and six days a week is a blessing. So we're not doing this here in ASEAN. Yeah, that's social socialization. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe uh, who wants to respond first and um, to Ryan's question and comments? Uh, uh, I, I, think I, I agree with your observations. You know, the I think. Because all the the mess in Southeast Asia, in my in my own case, uh, with the tie with the United States, is about abandonment, right? Because you know, the Thai elites, at least you know, like see U.S. Uh, as a you know uh, the supporter for a long times, and then with the abandons you know, uh, Thai the, uh, Thailand since the post Cold War period, uh, it's sort of like accumulated, right? And and the abandonments affect you know. Uh, happen every, I think like ha almost every decade. And they kind of like you know, reiterate, you know, the Thai uh, psyche, right? That, you know, United States is not, uh, it's not a reliable source of support. And then, and I think that, that that's, that's the, main, the main point. Uh, I think you are, you, your observation is quite uh, correct. And I think the, why we are not like doing anything with the you, uh, Chinese uh, more assertive roles in, 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 in the regions, I think one thing is that, you know, once you abandon, you know, like especially like a, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, the Chinese fill in the gap, right? You know, playing a lot of roles economically, politically, uh, militarily. So uh, we, if we have to respond, uh, you know, back to the Chinese, they also fear that, you know, the Chinese gonna respond back. And I think I, I, I was talking with uh, David yesterday or uh, you know, another person that actually, uh, when you refuse the Chinese, right, you receive punishment very clearly. When you refuse the U.S. Uh, or, you know, uh, fail to accommodate the United States, you normally just got the verbal criticism, right? So that's in that sense, you know, like uh, the both, you know, additional and material, uh, you know, uh, outcome of that, you know, uh, uh, refusing the Chinese is greater than, you know, refusing the, the U.S. 
uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, so that's why, like, you know, like when Cheng Shui was uh, talking about the, the railway projects, uh, it's, you know, like we also get a response, you know, very harshly from, 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 from the Chinese. Right, the first BRI summit when uh, the Chinese think that you know we were so slow to implement this you know <laughs> uh, high-speed railway, they didn't really invite us to the first summit. You know that's kind of like a diplomatic shame, right? Uh, you know into the international communities. Like, why? It would be like you know like oh, uh, since 2014 they are very close, right? The Chinese support the, the Thai military junta, so they expect that you know they're gonna get invited, but then they. They, they lost face because you know they, they, they don't have the invitation. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, probably I, I'll stop here. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for your two questions. Uh, the first one about amendment. We have a saying, once bitten, twice shy. I think for the case of Vietnam, it's like many times bitten. Uh, in recent history, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, right, the U.S. just left uh, South Vietnam. Of course, it gave Vietnam, North Vietnam the victory, but that is also an experience. And uh, during those uh, very uh, late years of the Vietnam War, then China took advantage and took uh, the Paracel Islands and the U.S didn't do anything and we lost uh, the Paracel since then. I think that that w that is a very deep lesson for Vietnam. And then we didn't learn uh, in the 1980s, Vietnam entered into uh, a kind of alliance with the Soviet Union. And then that, make, that made Vietnam uh, becoming, uh, you know, isolated in the region and especially having a very hostile relationship with China. And then after that, we lost a few features in the spread list. Um, the Soviet Union didn't do anything. And there were even records that the Soviet Union or the US, those, those years said that, oh, we, we wouldn't do anything. I think those two experiences are, are deeply etched in the Vietnamese uh, psyche. And that's why it leads to the current three no's um, uh, principle in the Vietnamese military uh, doctrine, no military, foreign military base, no alliance, and no, um, not allowing the territory of, uh, for the, another country to attack another country. So even for Vietnam, which would not consider the US a treaty ally or an ally, um, the sense of abandonment is still there, uh, not to mention other I mean, even in the Philippines as well. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by your second question about um, why China is, I mean, the prevailing um, discourse in the US and other Western countries is that China is a revisionist, an authoritarian state uh, layered with the revisionist uh, foreign policy, right? And how come it doesn't register among Southeast Asian countries? I think it doesn't mean that it does not register. There are many ways to explain why Southeast Asian countries have uh, adopted an ambivalent response uh, to China. Um, first of all, I think proximity, right? China is the unavoidable great power in the region, whether we love it or we hate it or we fear it, we have to live with China and maintaining a constructive, friendly relationship with China is, at least for Vietnam, is a prerequisite for its foreign policy. Um, I think I tend to, to, to frame it this way. The US is more loved than feared because you are, even though you claim that you are a resident power, but you are far away. China is more feared than loved. But when it co push comes to shove, we have to pay certain deference to the Chinese uh, in interests and preferences uh, to the extent that the trade-offs are not so unacceptable, right? As Cheng Chui mentioned in his uh, article. But another way of looking at it is that China has been very successful as well in not only uh, um, sending the assurances to Southeast Asian countries in one way or another, but also in doing certain kind of psychological conditioning to Southeast Asian ruling elites. Uh, something like um, scholar Evelyn 
go, right? I li really like her, her, her framing of hegemonic stability in which China would say there are certain core interests that you have to respect and defer. But other than that, we will ensure that we will not attack you, we will ensure security, but, and you will enjoy all the economic benefits. Uh, it doesn't mean that economic benefits are equally win-win for both sides. We all know that there are many complexities and, 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 and nuances into that. But I think this kind of Chinese offering of a kind of hegemonic stability, hegemonic um, uh, security is there. And it has increasing, it, it has increased uh, more traction among the Chinese discourse and foreign policy towards Southeast Asian countries. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much uh, for um, your active participation in all this and uh, very great responses from uh, our uh, paper authors. Uh, we're going to take a break now and then we will have, uh, we'll come back for the last session of the day. Um, we should come back in about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we only have uh, six minutes. Okay. <laughs>